As James said, we've been doing a series since Easter that we've um, called Easter People. Um, and we've wanted to spend a bit of time um, just looking at what difference the resurrection made in the lives of people that Jesus made after he was raised from the dead. And therefore, what difference it means and it might make in our lives. So we've um, looked at when Jesus met with his disciples um, on the beach and had breakfast with them. Um, we've looked um, at the, the encounter that he had when he was walking um, from Jerusalem to Emmaus with two of his followers. Um, and then last week, Hannah um, looked at that meeting that um, Jesus had with Thomas, forever known as Doubting Thomas. Um, and, and in that, we were allowed to explore that actually doubts are a quite natural part of faith. Um, each time looking at actually how the, the truth of the resurrection makes a real difference. Um, and so this week, we're going to look at another encounter that Jesus had with actually a group of his followers. Um, and it's one that he, when he met them in a room that they had locked up because of the fear of what was going on. And he met with them. And, and this encounter helps us to see um, how that fear um, turned to peace. And so we're going to be looking at, at peace this morning. Peace in, um, in the midst of difficult circumstances. We're not looking so much as, as kind of world peace and that kind of big world picture, but inner peace that Jesus um, offered those disciples and offers us still. Um, and of course, that inner peace that we experience naturally spills out into the world around us, the people around us. But, but this, is, this is kind of personal for us. And of course, I know that there will be some of us this morning in the middle of really difficult circumstances, not very peaceful places we find ourselves. You know, difficulties with relationships in family and friends, um, difficulties and upset in work, with our health, with so many different things around. And so in the midst of those difficulties... Some of us are really wanting and needing to hear Jesus saying, peace be with you. So we're going to explore a passage in the Bible together. We're going to Luke's Gospel, to the end of Luke's Gospel. And just to set the scene before I read the passage, this actually comes just after Jesus has met with those followers as they were walking to Emmaus. So Jesus is risen from the dead. The tomb is empty. The disciples are wondering what on earth is going on. Um, he's had this encounter with two of them where he spoke about the scriptures and they had a meal together and he broke bread and they go, oh, it's Jesus, right? Okay, he's risen from the dead. And they then made their way back to Jerusalem and they made their way back to Jerusalem and gathered with all the other followers. And we pick up the story from that point. They've gathered back together again. So we're in Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 36. And there are some Bibles on the pillars. So if you want to grab one of those and read along or read along on your phone, but it's going to come up on the screen as well. While they were still talking about this, that's the encounter of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. 
and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So another incredible encounter that his followers had with Jesus after he'd risen from the dead. And his message in this to them was peace. Peace be with you, he said. So what is this peace about, this peace that Jesus offers, this this Christian peace? Well, when Jesus uses that word peace, he's echoing that um, Hebrew word, shalom which is a peace that is all-encompassing and holistic. It's a peace in, in mind and soul and body. It's not a peace that comes out of um, nice circumstances, but this different kind of peace. It's not merely an absence of fear, but the presence of protection. Um, it is peace, as described in the Bible, that is beyond human understanding. Something that is difficult for us to grasp because it can come to us in the midst of the difficulty. It's not about being taken out of the problem. It's about Jesus' peace coming to us in the midst of that problem and how we might experience that. Now, the difficulties that we might be facing at the moment... Um, can be many and varied. And, and just as we're, we're going to go on and talk about inner peace, but I just wanted to say something before we explore this a little bit more, because um, sometimes there are experiences and, and circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in, or we know that those that we love are in, which need action as well as peace. Um, and if you are experiencing or you know somebody who's experienced abuse of any kind, then that situation needs action as well as, as, well as peace. And so um, I'd encourage you to seek some support in that. And you will find there are posters around the church about safeguarding. And, and on that, you'll find um, links to, to our website and then links into places that can provide support and offer support. So, so do seek that if you need um, some action in the midst of those circumstances. Jesus offers something that is um, beyond human understanding. And he offers it to those disciples um, in that room. They were all gathered together. They were gathered together because they were afraid. They were afraid because their leader had been killed on a cross and everybody was out to get them. They were not in an easy, comfortable part of life. But what Jesus knew they needed was peace. And so we're going to look at the two things that, um, that he did to help them with peace. Because you'll probably be really pleased to know that the kind of peace that Jesus gives us is not about our personalities. It's not because we are naturally disposed to be peaceful people. Because if we were, we'd all be stuffed, probably. Because there are very few of us that are naturally peaceful people that never feel any anxiety or any fear. Now, peace um, is something that can be learned, Tim Keller, who was um, a pastor in New York and an author of many books um, about Jesus and and kind of living a life with him, speaks about how we can actually learn peace. It's not a natural thing. It's something that that we can learn. It's something that if we put um, some effort into and some focus on, we can learn to experience and encounter this peace of God more deeply. And these disciples were learning that in this story. The first thing that they learnt was that um, it's important to see Jesus clearly. Seeing Jesus clearly is so helpful for us as we experience his peace, in order to experience his peace. The disciples, those followers, they were all gathered together. Now they could see Jesus. He wasn't invisible to them. But they couldn't really see who he really was. And so what Jesus did is he met them at their point of need. And first of all, he shows them his hands and his feet. Now, those hands and feet are marked with holes 
where the nails went when he was crucified on the cross. And so by looking at his hands and his feet, they know that the person who's with them is not someone who's just pretending to be Jesus, someone who's dressed up to look a little bit like him, to make them feel a little bit better, that actually it wasn't a big disaster, um, it's okay. Because that would be a false situation. It would be a false kind of sense of peace. No, he wanted them to know that it was really him. It was really the one who had died on the cross. And by knowing that, they knew that this Jesus standing in front of them was the one who loved them so much that he died on the cross for them. The one who loved them and sacrificed himself so that they might be forgiven and come into a relationship with God. They saw Jesus that little bit more clearly. And the second thing that he did is he helped them to see that he wasn't a ghost because they naturally thought he was a ghost. And he goes, look, I've got flesh and, and bones. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones. And then he said, look, can you give me something to eat? Now, they gave him a piece of broiled fish. I'm not sure whether that was what he really wanted. It doesn't sound great, but anyway, they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And the detail's really important because he took that fish and he ate it in their presence. So they could see him eating Now, ghosts don't eat. They could see that this was a real person. This was not a kind of a a vague sort of spirit. And that was really important because Jesus was really alive. And because Jesus was really alive, something miraculous had happened. He had been raised from the dead, which meant that the cross was not the end. It was not a disaster. He was not dead. He was alive which meant that evil had been defeated. It means that um, death has been defeated. There is life beyond this life. There is eternity with Jesus. We have him now and we have him for all, all eternity. It matters that he was alive. And as they saw him eating, they realized this is a real person. The resurrection really happened. And they saw him that little bit more clearly. Now, I don't see Jesus that clearly. Um, I expect many of you are thinking, I don't really see him that clearly either. And it could be because um, you're new to faith, new to thinking about things of faith. And and actually, the picture of Jesus is just being put together bit by bit. It's a bit fragmented. There's a few little things, but you're not quite sure what he's really about. Or it might be that actually we've been following Jesus for a long time, but we're aware when we think about it that that maybe some of the things that we think about him, some of the ways in which we see him, are perhaps not quite lined up properly. We've not got quite the picture that we want to have. Um, Now, we will never have a full picture of Jesus. We won't see him clearly. The Bible tells us we won't see him clearly until we see him face to face in life beyond this life. But it is possible to see him that little bit more clearly. Um, And that makes all the difference in the world when it comes to um, knowing his peace. Because when we see who he really is, we know that the peace is real. And it's based on something real. Um, Where do we see him most clearly? Where is it in life that we see him most clearly? Well, you know, sometimes I think it's when things are the most difficult, when we most need to see him clearly, when we most need to know what he's really like. Those are the points at which we, we can encounter him and see him clearly. And sometimes it's at the very point of our weakness that we see Jesus most powerfully and in, in, in who he really is. Um, a couple of weeks ago, James was preaching, and he was preaching on that passage, as I said, that walking the road to Emmaus, and, and he was talking about seeing as well, and he shared with us his um, fascination for um, kind of visual illusions. You know, there's things that you see and actually look more carefully, and you can see what they're really like, and um, in the evening service, he shared one of these visual illusions. I've decided not to, because he said it was, um, it was a disaster, because he could never get anyone's attention afterwards. Everyone was just trying to see what was going on in the picture. So I'm not going to show it to you, otherwise we'll get massively distracted. But essentially, this was a picture of kind of three, at least I think it's a picture of three individuals. And the idea was you looked really, really closely and see if you could see the face of Jesus. 
Um, now, some of you will know that I've got a visual impairment, which means that my vision is quite blurred, and, and, and particularly from a, a distance, it's quite blurry. So it's... Um, you know, in a sense, it's a bit of a weakness, really, because it's not working that great. But and in the evening service, um, I was sitting at the back, and, and James was showing this picture. And I turned and I said, what's supposed to be going on here? Because it's just the face of Jesus. Because my blurred vision meant I couldn't see the other thing that everyone could see really clearly. I amazingly could only see the face of Jesus. Now, I'm not pretending that I can see the face of Jesus really well, and um, aren't I great? And that would be arrogant and quite annoying. Um, it's just an example that sometimes in the presence of our weakness, we get to see him most clearly. And sometimes it's because everything else has been stripped away. All those other things that we look for to give us peace have gone. They're shaky. They're, they're disappearing. And we need to see Jesus because we know that we need his peace. And at that moment of our deepest need is where we see him most clearly. And where maybe we're more open to receiving the peace that he has to give us. He met the disciples at their point of need. They needed to see the hands and the feet. They needed to know he was real. And he's just like that with us today. So that's the first thing. It's about seeing who Jesus really is. And the second thing that we learn about learning about this peace, learning um, more deeply to experience it, is in the second part of the, of the encounter that we have. And it's all about thinking the right things, thinking the truths about Jesus. Because he goes on to say, and the passage says, that he opened their minds and so Jesus takes them through the story of the scriptures and he says, look, this is where I was right from the beginning all the way through to where you find yourselves now and then on into the future, into all eternity. And in the scriptures, he took them to the past, to God creating the world, to his engagement full of grace with his people down the ages until he came and was born as a baby in Bethlehem. He came from heaven down to earth. And then he came to the cross to show the full extent of his love by dying on the cross to pay our debt, as we were singing about, so that we might have a relationship with him and forgiveness and life with him in this life. And then he talked to them about the future for them. And the future immediately was that they were going to be those who, who told everybody about this message of forgiveness. It was going out to all nations and the Holy Spirit was going to come. He was going to be the power that they were going to receive from on high. And then into the future, which is eternal life, the end of the story. That in the midst of, of where they were, the truths about Jesus root them in his peace that we are loved by God, that he has demonstrated this through his death on the cross, that that love is full of power because he was raised from the dead and that he gives us his Holy Spirit to be with us now and then into all eternity with him. The best really is yet to come. The Bible talks about this thinking in a couple of ways. It talks about, um, in the Psalms, remembering all his benefits. There's a bit in the liturgy in the Church of England, in kind of a historic liturgy, which talks about all the benefits of his passion. His passion is his love for us, his death on the cross, his resurrection, all the benefits that come with that. Um, and Paul in his letter to Romans, in the midst of suffering, talks about how he can reckon with God. And in the midst of suffering, that this is nothing compared to the eternal glory that will happen. And that word reckon is about adding it up. It's about taking each of those true things about God and about us and remembering them, consciously adding them up. God's character is love. He's faithful. He came down to earth, born as a baby, because he loves us. He died on the cross because he loves us. He's raised from the dead. God is powerful. Death is defeated. 
I'm a child of God. He's with me for all eternity. Nothing can snatch me out of his hands. The love of God, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in our circumstances now or in the future can do that. Adding those things up, one, two, three, four. Consciously thinking and dwelling on the truths of God. Bring them into our minds and into our hearts. And it's something that we can all do. You know, it's not just for the blessed few who are naturally peaceful. This is for all of us unpeaceful people who long for the peace of God. This is something that we can think deeply about. Allow ourselves to to chew over these truths about who God is and who we are in him. And we do this on our own and we do it through reading scripture, through reminding ourselves and and bringing that story to mind again and again. And we do this together because often when things are most difficult, I find we need somebody alongside us to help us remember, to help us see a bit more clearly who Jesus is and to help us think on the things that are true that will help and root us in his peace. And that's why we're here together now. That's why um, following Jesus is not an individual pursuit. It's why we get together in groups. It's why we um, come along to Discipleship Stream. It's why we come to Alpha together, to um, hear the truths about Jesus, to see him more clearly. It's why we pray for one another. And so we do this together. And we do this with the most precious gift that Jesus spoke about there, this power that's coming from on high. In John's account of Jesus' life, near the end of his life, he spoke to his followers and said, peace I leave with you. And that peace is made present to us by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in that encounter in, in John, the Holy Spirit's called the helper. He's the one that helps us through these circumstances. He's the one that actually lives in us and makes Jesus' peace real in us. We are not left alone as orphans, it says, because the helper is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. And so we find ourselves today, like the disciples, they were in a pretty difficult situation at that point. And we might be finding ourselves in a whole load of tumult. And Jesus comes And he steps into our lives. And just as he said to them, he says to us, peace be with you. His gift of peace. Something that is for each one of us. Something that we learn and develop and grow in as we see him more clearly. And as we, our minds are filled with truths about him. The resurrection is really good news. This encounter is really good news for them and for us today. Amen.